Here we go. Welcome to the Cabinet Maker Profit System Podcast, just for wood shop owners like cabinet makers, architectural mill workers, closet companies, those of you that make wine racks, those of you that make fine furniture. If you're interested in the business of the wood shop business, if you want to work smarter and not just harder, you're in the right place. My name is Dominic Rubino, and I'll be your host. And today's guest is Coach Lee Miller. Now, you've heard me talk about our coaches before. I'm proud of every single one of them. And I have Lee Miller, Coach Lee Miller, who's one of the coaches on my team. He's actually working with quite a few of you who are listening to the show today. Hi to you. Uh, Coach Lee Miller is with us today to talk about the difference between gross and net profit. Now, you might think this is going to be boring. It's not. This is actually the reason you listen to this show. The that little word net profit is what we're working towards. It's why we run our systems properly. It's why we put simple systems in place. It's how we think about hiring people. It's how we think about taking on jobs. It's everything. Lee and I train a lot on this. All of the coaches on my team team train a lot on this. And today, Lee and I are going to dissect gross and net profit in a way you've never heard before. There's going to be some screen sharing. You're going to want to look at that. And if you ever have questions, reach out to us and we'll walk you through it. But I think you're really going to enjoy uh, hearing a little bit about Lee's background and also understanding how a business coach takes apart and reassembles the discussion around gross and net profit. For those of you who haven't been here before, what's this podcast all about? Well, I show contractors how to get back in control of their construction business, even if they don't know where to start. And the truth is, you don't need a lot of extra time. You don't need a business degree. You don't need to have seen somebody do it. You don't need any of that to build a profitable, solid contracting business. What you need are simple systems. Simple systems you might not have learned at your kitchen table growing up. We're going to show you those systems here on this podcast. What happens when you have simple systems is that you get this quiet confidence. Now, for too long, our industry has been keeping secrets. Secrets of success, secrets of how to make money, secrets about how to think about business, secrets about how to think about growth, the secrets behind people, the secrets behind time management. I'm here to put an end to that. On this show, you're going to learn how to use simple systems in three different places. Number one, in the office. Number two, on a job site. And number three, in your shop. Now, more important than that, I also show people the secrets of business success. How to work smarter, not just harder. And inside of that, how to have a mindset of growth. Now, while we're talking about mindset, I got a couple of dad jokes for you. I know you guys are looking forward to these. Why dad jokes? Why bad jokes? Why dad jokes poorly de delivered with, with poor, poor timing? That's how I do it. But I want to get you laughing. I want to get your mind open. I want you to hear and understand what Coach Lee has to say. And to do that, let's get you in creative mindset. And to get you in a creative mindset, let's get you laughing a little bit. So I want you to think about this. This is one of my favorite things. I like to think about the boardroom of a company when they're making big decisions. Like one of the things my my uh, my son showed me a couple of years ago is Oreo cookies, and they had um, colored sprinkles in them. <laughs> and so we were driving along. I think we were going on a fishing trip or something. And I said, you know, I want you to imagine the boardroom meeting where they're sitting around and the the president gets up and says, all right, Oreo cookie executives, let's find a way to put more sugar in an Oreo cookie. And so everybody goes around the table and some guy goes, sprinkles, we're going to put sprinkles in. And the boss looks at him and says, you're a genius. You're going to go places in this company. You know, think about those kind of things. I do anyways, because I'm a business coach, right? Um, but then thinking about Chipotle, Chipotle charges like a buck 30 for extra guacamole. So I wonder if in their business meetings, they refer to their guacamole product profits as avocado. Wah, wah, wah. I laugh at my own jokes because they're bad. I know. Uh, hey, for those of you who are fitness minded, I know we've actually got a couple of uh, uh, people listening who run marathons or run races, a couple who do triathlons. Think about this. What race is the most profitable race that you can run? Well, it's a 401k. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Um, I inherited some land or recently. Now, um, and what I did is I bought a hundred donkeys for a hundred dollars and I was going to sell them one by one for a profit, but overnight some wacko broke into my farm and cut 
all the donkeys' tails off. Can you believe that? And now I'm left with 100 donkeys with no tails, and I'm going to have to wholesale them. Now, you might wonder why I'm going to have to wholesale them. I can't retail them, can I? Here's one to think about as you're driving along. Now, if you're not in the States, this won't make sense, but there's a there's a bank in the States, and it's got a name that always makes me wonder. It's called Fifth Third Bank. I don't think they understand how to number things, which is really how I judge a bank. Um, hey, listen, here's a quick story that it might actually be happening in your town right now, but there's this local charity. They never gotten a donation from the town's banker. And so the director of the charity calls him up and he says to the banker, hey, our records show that you make half a million a year, but you haven't given a penny to charity. Would you like to help the community? The banker thinks about it for a second and he says uh, to the bank, he says to the charity, did you? know that my mother is ill and she has extremely expensive medical bills? Ah, uh, no, mumbled the director. Or that my brother, my only brother, is blind and unemployed. Uh, no, I didn't know that. Did you know that my sister's husband died and he left her broke with four kids? Well, now the director's embarrassed and he's a bit back on his heels. I, mean, I, I had no idea. The banker continues, if I don't give them any money, why would I give any to you? Oh, I know you guys are going to tell that one in the job site. Yeah. Look, if you're a business owner who's curious to find ways to run your business profitably, to have more time off, to run this business like an honest to goodness company so you can do the things you love, to build a team you can rely on and grow a company one day you could sell or pass on to somebody else or just live off the cash flow or go on a cruise and let somebody else run it while you're away, while you're in the right place. I'm a business owner. I'm also a business coach. The only people I work with are construction and contracting business owners who want to get to the next level in their business. Now, I host this podcast because one day I want to be your business coach. As a matter of fact, I have a team of business coaches like Lee Miller, who you're going to meet in a few minutes. I have personally hand-selected and trained each and every one of them. I have very high expectations for the people that join my team, and I'm proud of every single one of them. As you listen to this podcast, ask yourself if you think me and my team might be the right tool to help you get to the next level. Now, with that being said, let me go into business coach mode right now. I'm going to challenge you in this episode with myself and Coach Lee. You're going to hear something. You're going to learn something, or you're going to realize something. On that, whatever it is, I want you to find a way to take action in the next 24 hours. Look at your watch right now, 24 hours within a day. But then what I want you to do is pay attention to how that improves your business or your life. It might only be a small improvement, but it's an improvement. I hope you know this podcast is built to do three things, educate, inform, and inspire you. So I'm going to get in your head and I'm going to ask you an inspirational question. Are you happy being a contractor who runs a few crews? Or do you want to be a business person who just happens to run a construction company? By the end of today's episode, you'll know the answer. Let's get to it. Uh, Mr. Lee Miller, how the heck are you? I'm good, Dominic. It's good to be on the podcast. I know. I should introduce you as the famous, growing to be famous. Growing to be famous. Up and Co coming, I would say. Coach Lee. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited to have you on here, man. It's actually, it's been too long. Yeah, I know. We should have done this way sooner, but I'm, I'm stoked. I think um, I think this is the right time because now that we've, you know, we've been in this for a while now and, you know, we've got some really good content and clients, like it's it's a good time to kind of officially put something up on on the this, the podcast here. So yeah. I'm stoked. I am very stoked. That's good. Now, <clears throat> somebody out there listening to the podcast might say to themselves, where is that delightful accent? <laughs> from so actually let me back up let me i'm gonna i'm gonna do the opening question and maybe in there you can weave in your delightful sure. accent but uh <clears throat> you ready for this lee let's go coach lee miller who the heck are you and how is it you come to be speaking all these cabinet makers architecture mill workers closet guys uh wine room makers all around the world 
Awesome. Great question, Dominic. Uh, yeah. So my name is Lee Miller. I'm the head coach at 10X BLT and I work with Dom hand in hand, working with our lovely cabinet makers, architectural millwork companies, closet companies. Yeah. Basically, if you make a chopping board and you want some coaching, you come to me. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I help our contractors get organized, scale up, hit their goals, set big plans, you know, and help them achieve them. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, people might, you know, so we've got this show, the cabinet maker profit system. We've got another show called Profit Tool Belt. You're going to be a guest on there as well, by the way. Did you know that? I did. Well, ah, yeah. not a surprise. I saw, I, I, I saw the calendar invite. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <clears throat> but then we've got this 10x built thing going on. This is our this is our coaching division. This is where you and I do our coaching, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about yourself and this this charming accent with the fiery red beard. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm definitely the full package Scotsman for sure. I'm originally <laughs> from uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, yeah. Kind of the poster child, I would, I would say. Um, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, I've been coaching for a while now. I, um, I actually came up through the construction industry myself. My first job that I ever had was, uh, was an apprenticeship doing contract flooring for big infrastructure projects in the oh, UK. No um, so I grinded out, I'm going to say grinded out a four-year apprenticeship uh, back in kind of old school. European uh, style apprenticeship. European, yeah, European style apprenticeship. You know, company culture was never a word there. Uh, you know, basically motivating apprentices at that point was just, you know, chirping them and flicking cigarettes at them. So I grew up in a, I grew up in a hard time. It was kind of hardcore, get your hands dirty, um, kind yeah. of hard technical apprenticeship but it was good because it let me cut my teeth on huge infrastructure projects um and i actually worked my way right into leading a team uh to do some of the the flooring and some of the biggest projects in scotland mm. uh you know thinking you know flooring and say like universities commercial linoleum and big kitchens that kind of thing so okay fully immersed in those huge projects you know like two hundred thousand which- square feet of carpet or more, tile or something or like that or more or more yeah we were really? talking you know you know anywhere between 700 and say 1.5 million dollar contracts at a time just in flooring for some of these projects wow. that we were doing so yeah yeah crazy crazy big um but yeah i did that i did that all the way through until 2008 and i mean there's a lot of guys listening here who just cringed when i said 2008 because yeah. i think that hit a lot a lot of people pretty hard and it did yeah. it hit our company too so that was my first experience going through a proper recession in the construction field um and the company unfortunately went into liquidation you know Ouch. when you've got contracts that size and you've got that much money outstanding in ar and that much uh you know on the <laughs> hanging on the edge for a for timing wise a recession is just an absolute killer um but that was actually a blessing in disguise for me because i kind of changed paths for a while and actually went into the hospitality industry i know Um, this is it's always interesting to me that you went and did this but uh i think i think it adds to how well you do with clients now so i'll let you continue with the story of course. And you'll kind of see this as I go through more of my experiences, like each layer of my experience kind of ties into coaching now, because I kind of pieced yeah. together like some of the biggest uh, topics, let's say. Um, but I moved into the hospitality field uh, and I worked my way up into being a general manager for one of the biggest hospitality businesses in the UK. Mm. Uh, they have over a thousand units there. And um after a while, uh, I became really, really good at training. So training new employees, recruiting mm. new employees. And they actually gave me a job in the development side from a corporate, from the corporate office, Yeah, um, which was super cool. Cause I got, to, I got to travel all the way around the UK, standing up in front of, you know, 30, 40, 50 people and delivering the, the, the training that we were giving them, but also designing new processes and systems to actually deliver too. So that yeah. is actually where I found my love of people development and training and, being in, yeah, and training and it's you know that's carried with me well since then right? yeah you know what i find interesting is that hospitality business attracts the same level uh like uh what you call it experience level of employee that we get in the trades entry Absolutely. level maybe trying to find themselves they're passionate about something but they're not sure what area they're passionate about in and so you you took that leap as a as a leader to show them the path and how we do it here and yeah, I've seen that. Sure. I've seen that bleed through with the clients that you've got here. As yeah, well. and it, yeah, and it's typically one of the things I always recommend to our clients too. Whenever we're talking about recruitment, there's always a guy in the hospitality the hospitality field who is dying for an opportunity to get into something a bit more technical with a steadier kind of work week. 
right? Yeah. But he can't see his way out of hospitality. So tip number one from Coach Lee is always be recruiting when you're at a restaurant. Keep an eye out because there might be someone there who might be your next best employee. Could be your next installer, sure. your next laborer. Your, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they'll be very generous for the opportunity as well. So yeah, yeah. But hospitality gave me a really good start of, you know, learning how customers think learning about processes and systems and how crucial they are to kind of huge operations. You know, when you're trying to get food out in a timely manner and you've got a really crazy, uh, you know, busy restaurant, the pressure that's on you when you've worked in that, you oh. actually learn how to work under that level of pressure. And it's it's all transferable skills into say construction or yeah. any field really, you know? So yeah. hospitality is a, a really good place to kind of cut your teeth and learn all about customers, customer service, you know, on the flip side of hospitality, you also get to see the worst in people. You know, there are, you know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, you kind of see people, they're most demanding. Over-served? Oh, okay. Over-served. I thought you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. People that are most demanding, general public, that kind of thing. So you do really get to learn how to work with adverse, you know, clients who, you know, want to cause you a bit of adversity. But, yeah. you know, those, that, that it just builds character, right? Builds character. So, yeah. So I did that for a while. Um, and I actually decided at that point that I wanted to start my own coaching business uh, way back then. So it was 2013, I believe it was when I actually yeah. launched my first coaching company, which is called Emco. Um, if you've ever seen, um, oh, sorry, uh, if you've ever seen um, uh, John uh, Tavers on Bar Rescue, you ever yeah. seen that? Yeah, 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 John yeah, Taffer, yeah. Taffer. Yeah, Taffer, yeah. sorry, yeah, yeah. 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 He so, is um, not the kind of coaching we do. No, absolutely not. not. So, but that was what my coaching business was all about, right? Was going into failing hospitality businesses and oh, helping them okay. turn things yeah, around. Yeah, so very yeah. similar to that, maybe without the attitude and the cameras. Yeah. But I was going into these uh, these restaurants. I was helping small business owners. Now that's a very, very niche market that I was working in. So I did have another job on the side of that as well. Of course, yeah. Um, where I was uh, a technical recruiter. I got into headhunting for a while. You see here how I'm living. So the people side, yeah, the people suit. side keeps. Yeah. yeah, so on the people side, which ended up, I, you know, I became really, really good at that, and um, I was making quite a bit of money at that time as you know a twenty year old, like you know, young twenty year old. Um, so kind of changed gears a little bit, took my eye off my own business and focused on that. But I ended up becoming um one of the main suppliers to the offshore oil and gas industry for mechanical and electrical engineers, mm. uh, big infrastructure projects, you know. We, we basically sourced employees and put them on job sites throughout the UK, uh, the UK for temporary labor. Ah. So headhunting, I became really, really good at it, you know, and I, and I hate to toot my own horn here, but I had a, a thing I could just get people to, you know, come and work for us on these projects, which was great. But the bad thing about this was you were at the mercy of the contractors that you were placing these people with. So I knew how to entice people to come oh, and work. But I when see. you put them on these temporary contracts, you know, there's a little bit because if the company have... they worked for, if the if the construction company they were working for wasn't a good place to work, this is out of your absolutely. control. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So we would end up, you know, like ultimately having people. And I think by the time I was kind of working my way out of that role, I had over 140 people working under me that I'd recruited in place. How many, um, how many people do you think you interviewed in order to place? 140 oh thousands thousands it has to be thousands, thousands. the top of the yeah. funnel has got to be enormous 100 percent, yeah thousands and thousands of people lots of conversations that's not even including the conversations that we had just to get to the interview phase mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and it really was uh one of those roles that demanded you had to be available all t- all day every day even at night you got a last minute contract that came in you had to you know jump in go through your Fill database it fill it you had to fill it that was the thing um and we had pressure cooker you, that's a pressure cooker again huge but, huge pressure cooker but one of the things that we actually did was is not only did we recruit these people hmm. we also maintained some sort of hr function for them afterwards because they were technically still working for us they were just oh, okay they're contract the employees system. right yeah and this is kind of a classic example of, a, of what a lot of our contractors and clients fall into, where you get spread a bit too thin and you're taken away from the thing that you're really good at. So I was really good at recruiting and placing people on job sites. I wasn't so passionate about the HR site, right? Handling yeah. disputes between the contractor and, and you know, and the, yeah. and, and the, the handholding, the fuzzy stuff. Exactly. Yeah. 
And so that became quite overwhelming. And, and for me, I knew that at that, that point, I, it didn't matter about money for me. I had to get out. It was too much pressure. I was missing, mm. uh, you know, I was missing dates with my wife, you know, at the time. Were you guys married you know, at the time or were you dating? We No, we were just dating at the time. But it was, you know, when you know she's the one, you want to give her all your attention. Yeah, of course. Um, of course. Yeah. Luck, luckily, she did marry me. And, you know, we have a beautiful daughter now. And <laughs> yeah, I uh, I managed to bag the girl in the end, but yeah, <laughs> it, it, it came close a few times. Um, but yeah, then uh, then I started setting my sights on North America. I wanted to move. So I, you know, I'd met with my partner. She has family, you know, over here. She brought me over for a vacation in 2014. And in 2016, we officially made the move. So we kind of okay. transitioned out of that and over here. Yeah. Um, and that's where and you then, went back into trades, right? I did. Well, originally I purchased into a, a partnership for a logistics company. So yeah. it was it was doing okay. When I when I bought into it, it was around about a million. We scaled that business to around about 6.3 million before I uh, purchased my next business, which was a commercial residential painting company. I like how you say that so casually. We took a business from one to 6.3, you know, as you do. Yeah. Well, well, one of the things that I didn't say, them, not only was I in charge of new openings in the hospitality job that I had, Mm. I was actually a, a turnaround coach in a sense where I would get sent to other units that were failing and kind of turn them around. That's, so. that's when you and I first met and I learned about the turnaround side of your yeah. background. It's a, it's a very specialty thing because you have to have, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got to have the ability to cut through all the fluff and focus on what has to be done now because everything's urgent. Everything's, everything's urgent, but you have to figure out the most urgent thing to turn around a company or a division or a team, don't you? Of course. Yeah, 100 percent. And there, you know, like this is, it. you know, I call it the, the failure fog, right? When a business is so foggy that you can't see the immediate action that you need oh, to actually take. Yeah. I like to think that I'm pretty good at just diving in, you know, sorting things out and putting them into different categories and identifying mm-hmm. like where the key uh, actions need to be put in place to actually turn things around. And that's yeah. exactly what I did in this painting business as well. When I took that painting business, it was over $140,000 in debt. It was struggling to survive. There was some people issues. There was, uh, you know, some really bad. I've heard the stories. I think you're, uh, you're understating the people issues, but uh... yeah, there was some major people issues. And and so basically I I came in there, uh, we did blank slate. So we fired the entire team and started from scratch, even with, you know, thousands of pro like thousands of dollars worth of projects on the schedule, like work in progress, but you had progress. You yeah. had whip and you still let people go. Now to, let's let's dig into that for a second because there's people listening sure. right now and they're saying, I'm booked out. Our calendar's book six, 16 weeks in advance. And I've got some people on the team that I'd prefer not to have, but I can't let them go or I'm going to break promises in the field. You, How did you navigate that? Yeah, you so this was, it was a bit of a harsh reality for me. I gave it, I said I would give it two weeks of observation. So when I bought the company and I moved in mm-hmm. on day one, I said, I'm going to give it two weeks of observation. Sure. And I just wanted to stand back and see how things were operating. This was before we had let go of the general manager or, you know, the existing team or anyone in it. Um, but I was privy enough that the the logistics company that I worked for before I actually mm-hmm. shared an office with the office admin person for this painting business. Oh, small world. Yeah. Okay, Small that's world, new to right? me. I didn't realize that. Yeah, so I actually got to sit and listen to some. So of you've the been phone overhearing calls. for a long time. Okay. Yeah, and so I'd, I'd been overhearing some of the conversations that would come from, say, the general manager would go to the admin person, or she'd be privy to those, you know, meetings where they're going to let someone go or maybe discipline someone, and she would immediately pick up the phone and call the person on the team and be like, "You're never going to guess what you're getting fired on Friday." She would say it that. Was, it was crazy. It was crazy. She was trying to be everyone's friend. Anyway, so um, I kind of knew that there was a, a major problem in the business walking mm. in. So, you know, and that I guess that was one of the kind of the determining factors for me to actually purchase into this business as well as I, as I, I knew some of the problems at the top of the funnel. And I yeah. knew that I had some experience to actually turn them around. Um, so when I actually got my hands on the business, I said, all right, OK, blank slate. And I, um, I, fire, I fired everybody on the team bar for two people. I had two Except people that two. I said... Yeah. For two. So there was two people on the team that had lots of potential. But the challenge was, is when I fired everybody else, they walked too. Oh, they left on their own. They did. They didn't yeah. want to be part of this kind of grand reopening or, re, you know, building this business sure. back up. I understand. It's it's it seems like the, the rats are leaving the ship. This thing's dead. Like, you fire yeah. everybody. Let's get out of here. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, like, like I said, there was a lot of projects on the schedule and, and, you know, sometimes you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, an omelet, right? So, you know, we had to upset some customers early on so that we could grow the business to where it had to go later on at that time. So, I mean, mm. it was a, ne- it was a necessary evil and a lot of people feel between a rock and a hard place, but I mean, you've got two options there. You can upset some clients or you can upset yourself and just keep continuing to grind things out and really struggle yeah. to get there. I think so, the Spanish word for that is cojones. cojones. I, <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But this is where actually things got really tough. I mean, this is where, you know, mm. I'd, I'd given myself a major challenge that I had to overcome. And it took all of the pain points that people are going through right now in their construction businesses. Mm -hmm. And I was learning them individually firsthand and not only just seeing them also feeling the effects of the financial burden that comes with challenges in the business, the time commitments. I mean, I think there was, you know, at that time I was working, you know, I'd get up at five in the morning, I'd be on my laptop responding to emails, doing schedules. Then I'd be driving to the paint store. I'd go set up like three job sites with one van. I had one van. In fact, here's another little side story. Yeah. The day before I bought this, but or the day before I got my first day to start in this business, contract was signed. We were taking over. Yeah. One of the employees rolled one of the sprinter vans. He rolled. Oh, he rolled a sprinter. He rolled it. He rolled a sprinter. Yeah. 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 There's a backstory there. Anyway, didn't of course there is license. rolling a sprinter. There's thing. a backstory. Yeah. yeah. Whole thing. Um, so I was down to one van coming into it and uh, I was setting up two to three job sites every single morning. I would go and do some quotes. I'd go back and do touch-ups because I was too scared to like, I was going to ask if you were still on the tools. So you didn't want to ruffle the feathers of your new guys. So you did the touch-ups yourself. No. And I was really scared to actually go and tell them because as I was building this small team, I didn't want to lose these guys again. I understand. You know, so there was a lot of like, I would cover it up and I would actually take the brunt of half of the things that happened on site that didn't finish the job. Um, So I go do touch-ups, I'd do some estimates. Um, Then at night, six, seven o'clock at night, I'd go collect all the toolboxes from the job sites and I'd go home. I'd shove some food down my throat and I'd sit and do invoices, work orders. And I would sit until 1130 at night. Wow. You were husband of the year. Oh yeah. yeah. If I've, uh, if I've ever been as close to divorce, that was it. Yeah. That was it. And um, it's hard. It's hard when we put our spouse through, isn't it? You look of back, course. I look back and I'm like, how did Deidre ever, like the poor girl must have done something really bad in her past life. Absolutely. You know, yeah. to get this. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you know, that's how you know she's a keeper though, right? You know, the one that sticks by you. Sticks and watches by your, your side, channel. solid. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. So they both hear this episode. Yeah, I'm mind. really lucky. I have a, <laughs> a, a very supportive partner, you know, and um, yeah. she's she's been absolutely awesome, so. So anyway, yeah, I mean, we, we we grew that business. We put systems and processes in place. I got sick and tired of fixing things. I was sick and tired of is that, fixing Is that what drove you to put systems? But you were a systems guy before. Because I was. you come from hospitality. You'd seen the apprenticeship program in Europe, which everybody knows is uh, first mm-hmm. class. It's probably hard to be in it, but you guys get trained. People yeah, take apprenticeship sure. seriously. So you went on that path. And then by the time you got here to North America started to realize we needed systems or you needed absolutely systems. yeah 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 but again it's starting from scratch right which systems do you put in place first and what you know to try and fix things you know and there was no you know you you run into a blockade where there is no right answer for two or three systems it's like you all are equally needed and yeah. it's just grinding out Judgment one call. getting the next one getting in the next one and the thing about systems as well is systems take time to actually implement in your business. It's not like you can decide on a Monday that you're going to implement a new system <laughs> and then forget about it, you know, no. and, it's just and then your people have to buy in. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, typically it's like picking up any new habit is you need to work on these systems for 20 to 30 days for it to commit to memory, be put in place. Your team yeah. has their buy in and then it becomes an actual system, which is so why what you're saying ever, is yeah. it was hard even when you did it, even when I did it. Yeah. Even and when so I when we it. when we work with our clients who are all there, everybody here cares about quality. You know, you wouldn't be listening to this show if they didn't care about quality. But I want everybody to understand it's we know it's hard when you do it because we've done it and it's been hard when we've done it. But there's also shortcuts to be had. And that's what you and I teach. Of course. Yeah. And the other thing there as well is like we trialed systems, right? We mm. trialed systems that failed. We trialed systems that worked. So mm. You did know, you tell the, uh, did you tell the crew that hey we're going to try this system and see what works? 
No, so we would say that we're implement, implementing a new system. We had a feedback system, so we did have a system. So we got feedback first before we tried to implement it, but then okay. the measure and then look at the data, and then we would say, all right, okay, is this the right system or do we need to look at something else? So we did mm. develop a little bit of a system where we were kind of sorting through. Um, there wasn't a lot of buy-in in the beginning, though. You know, like no. typically when you What's try and introduce a new system, yeah. and I don't want to take too much away from your last episode because your last episode was all about systems, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, you need to have buy and you need to have people, and you need to see that the systems actually benefit everyone in the business. And it did take a while for that to click, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, we grew that business up to seven figures as well. Uh, I sold that business in 2021 um, to pursue coaching. Uh, full time. And uh-huh. I mean, here we are now, right? Here we so are now. That, but that's let me slow down for a second. So this is quite the the life cycle that you've had, because if I follow along at least two, you built and sold two companies and you're not, you're not 40 yet, are you? No, I'm 33. Good for you, man. Thanks, man. That is great. Most people yeah. will never sell a business. You know, they'll, they'll have one company and never sell it their whole life. You've sold two. For sure. And I think that's a mindset piece too, um, where, you know, when I look at a business, I look at it as an asset, right? Something that can be bought and sold. Uh, Whereas a lot of people, there's an emotional connection to their businesses that they just can't let go. I I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if some of that comes from fear. Like, what else would I do? I'm a cabinet maker. What else could I do? And then from our side of the desk, you and I are like, oh my God, goodness. Once you run it like a business, you can do anything. Of course. I like to think of it like the the kind of uh, the description of an entrepreneur, someone who builds businesses, not one single business, someone who builds businesses. Right. So, I mean, I like to think of it like I'll never get bored. I'll buy a business. I'll sell a business. And I, like that question, what is next? It just fires me up. You yeah. Know? Bring, like, the, the answer is bring it on. Bring it. Bring it. Absolutely. Bring it. I love it. Yeah. That is such a cool background. I'm glad we had a chance to talk about this. Because, and yeah. obviously you and I have talked a lot. We should tell the story about how you and I met because it's not, it is definitely no handrails. It, it's not Absolutely. a straightforward meeting. No, Do you want to tell your version of it? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of guys that are listening to this podcast might be thinking, oh, maybe they met some like contractors event or something yeah. like that. But no, I'm, no, that, that's not how it went down at all so on the side of actually being a business coach i run an organization called backcountry hunters and anglers it is a north america wide uh, organization who do advocacy for hunting and fishing opportunities and hunter education Um, i like to think of it as just a big social club (laughs) where i get to meet with all my friends and talk about hunting and fishing and getting outdoors um but yeah so we we do a we do a lot of events and we had a, a rifle that we were giving away at a raffle that we were raising money for a habitat restoration project that we were yeah. doing and dominic won the rifle you I, know he yeah came, i came, came by along. and bought a bunch of tickets because yeah, i believed yeah. in it and you know bha is interesting to me and i've been hearing about it a lot on like the uh mediator podcast and some other podcasts they talk about it and i when i saw you guys there i'm like well i gotta go check this out and i i buy those tickets not expecting to win. That's that's the way I give back. Like, okay, you want to protect wetlands for ducks? Let's do it. Oh, you want to promote fishing for kids? Absolutely. So I'll, if the raffle ticket is the way for me to do that, I can directly do that while I'm at the trade show, right? Or the Absolutely. conference, whatever you call it. So yeah. yeah. And I ended up winning. Yeah. 30 odd six. Yeah. 30 odd six rifle. And then, yeah, you came over to my place and we did a, a sketchy handoff on my front, on my front porch. We took I'm some sh- pictures. I'm sure the yeah. neighbors were like, what are these guys doing? Waving these guys yeah. 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 But yeah then but we got we, to talking. We did. Yeah. yeah. And, and some of our similarities in background are from way back. I used to do work with 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Yes. And your painting company was one of the sister companies to 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And then we kind of knew some of the same people and the conversation started from there. And at the time, the two podcasts were taking off and I needed help. And she's ever since then, you've been coaching with me. Absolutely. Working yeah. with a bunch of people who are now listening. Hello, everybody. We should say hi. Hello, to everyone. Them. Yeah. yeah. I think I think you would call this fate. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's pretty like cool. It was, it was meant to happen, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Just a matter of time. And here we are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So one of the things that you and I are here to talk about today, though, is gross and net profit. Absolutely. Wow, yeah. we just took a deep turn to what sounds like a dusty, dry street. No, it's the most, it is the I, funnest conversation absolutely. ever. Absolutely. Do you know what's funny to me is how 
I have to pull the profit conversation out of people. When I say, what do you want? They're like, oh, I want this and I want that. And I want this and I want that. I'm like, do you want more money? And I, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't care about money. I care about what I can do with money. And I don't even want things. I want experiences, which by the way, you missed a big piece of your background, which I think would be super cool at PA. Oh, uh, okay. We should touch on that too. But, but um, I often find that I have to remind people that it's okay to talk to us about money. It's okay to say to your business coach, because we're business guys just like you, like everybody listening, you should have business person conversations with us. And part of that is profits, profitability, gross and net, et cetera. Um, yeah, before we get to gross and net profit, can you tell us the other management leadership uh, gig that you had, which is super cool? Yeah, yeah. And I think it all comes back to that. What am I going to do next? And how I love that that kind of concept. Um, yeah, so after I sold my business, I decided I wanted to do something super fun. Yeah. For a little while, um, this is when my my daughter was was quite young. So I wanted to do something with fun in between, something I could show her pictures of when she gets older, and she's gonna go, "Dad was super cool." Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, actually, I actually took a job for a fishing charter, uh, building out their guide fleet of boats and and fishing guides to do salmon fishing charters. Um, and yeah, I got to do a little bit of guiding. I got to work with some awesome fishing guides. It was super fun. Yeah. My freezer was full of salmon for like two years. <laughs> it, was, it was it was good. That's never yeah. bad. Yeah. Yeah. No, never bad. But one of the things that came from that was um was just the importance of of networking and bringing people out onto the boats and fishing with them and spending time with your you, you know your clients and your suppliers and stuff like that so there's always a business lesson somewhere and it was good because i got to apply a lot of what we talk about in our coaching sessions mm. now uh to a, an industry where you know when you think fishing you don't think systems and process we got to apply a lot of that to it which made it very efficient right yeah you know? and that's it People don't know that the again. I know the company you were the uh, you were the GM there, right? I was the GM at Guiding Operations. Yeah, yeah. And so that that's a it's a very high end brand. For, so this, yeah, the customers that come to you have high expectations for customer service and success, which no guide, you know, wants to go out and get no fish. But your Absolutely. customers come in with the expectation that's going to be a premium service. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, I'm so happy that's... you brought those skills here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they say the the benchmark of a successful guide is someone that can take someone out, not catch any fish, and still have them come back and leave a five star <laughs> review. And that was definitely something that we that we could yeah. do. I'll keep that in mind if I ever get out on your boat. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. We're, we can still make it happen. But yeah, uh, yeah. Let's, sorry. Let's get to gross and net. For um, sure. And and I had started by saying I'm amazed at how many times I have to remind people that it's okay to talk to us about profits and profitability. It's okay. To make money on a job, but maybe let's leave that that met, that uh, mindset side and let me put it over to you to talk about gross and net, the differences and how we peel it apart. Yeah, absolutely. And this is this is a topic that I'm pretty passionate about myself. Where you know, back if I think put my mind back to way back when I bought into those businesses in the past, um, and and putting some of those systems in place when it came to financial data and tracking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was one of the biggest and most influential steps and systems that I put into my business. And mm -hmm. when we talk about gross profit, and I'm going to refer to it as GP, so I don't want to confuse anyone, but GP or, or, or gross profit margin, um, you know, there's a lot of contractors and clients that I work with that are even massive that there's still a bit of kind of vague understanding of how gross and net works and how it can be impacted. Mm -hmm. And so if there's there's a few big takeaways today from this podcast, which I hope there are, um, is is I really want to simplify it for people. I want to simplify it down into a way that's very, very easy to understand not only what it is, but also how you can take it by the horns and just drive it home. Mm. And a lot of people are brainwashed into thinking that it's all about net profit. Right. It's all about net profit, which you're kind of half right. But net profit is, is a, a result. Goal. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's a byproduct of everything that you do before that. Yeah. Um, and, and when we talk about GP, if you can master GP, you can master net. If you can master gross profit, you can master net because the only difference between gross and net is expenses. And yeah. expenses are mostly fixed. They're easy to manage. Yeah. The gross profitability side on it is there's so many moving parts within that. that just to, to get to gross profit. Just to get to gross profit, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, 
And uh, yeah, I am going to share my screen here for the people that are watching on YouTube. But if you do want to look at the, you know, if you want to just listen to this on the podcast, I, mean, I will try and explain this in a way where you can listen to it and try and get it. But if you can get on YouTube later and actually check out the sheets that I'm going to take you through, uh, it might make things a little bit easier. Yeah. And these are the sheets that we already use for coaching. I've made a couple of, yeah. So it's the, the sheets that I'm using are adaptations of that just for this exercise. I've kind of simplified them a little bit down so that mm. it's very, you know, into some good examples for you. Um, but I'll, before we get into that, before I share that, I'd like to say a little bit, uh, just say something on mindset when it comes to to GP and net profit, if that's okay. Yeah. And, it, and if you're if you're a contractor sitting in the truck listening to this, um, imagine it, right? Like if you're if the first half of your year you didn't get to keep the money, any of it, right? Just say that every penny that you made was already gone. And then in the back half of the year, right? Say for the next four months or so, you didn't get to keep any of that money either. And it was only in the last three months of the year or last two months of the year that you actually got to keep money. When you got to that last two months in the year, would you take your foot off the pedal? Dominic, can you answer that? Uh, I wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Right. No. But this is, you know, this is a kind of way that you can force yourself into thinking like, hey, all right. Okay. If I, if I want to make a million dollars, I'm losing 50% because that's all getting spent to produce the rest. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I've got my 30% expenses to come off of that, give or take. Right. Yeah. So 30 30 percent. You don't get to keep that either. It's only the 20 percent or less that you actually get to keep. Yeah. So how this applies here is, is more of a mindset thing where you don't want to do all the work just for the net portion, just to wait till the very end to get paid. Right. You're already the last guy to get paid. If you're an entrepreneur who owns a contract and business, you're already the, the last, last guy, guy. Yeah. to get paid. Right. Yeah. Suppliers. Uh, you know, vendors, labor, all of that stuff. Everybody pinches money away from you until the very, very end and you're left with what's left, right? So where can you impact this? Well, you can impact this on GPM, right? You can impact this by man actively managing and taking control of your gross profit. Mm. And it's really, really simple. So I am going to share my screen here for anyone who is yeah, go uh, ahead. at home. Um, and if you, if you jump on uh, YouTube later, uh, definitely check this out and have a look through the screen, right? And I'm, I'm going to start high level and we're going to talk about your whole business over the course of a year. So we're going to talk about a P&L, right? Now, this is a document that confuses a lot of clients or a lot of uh, contractors, mm. right? They think that the only person that has access and can understand their P&L is their accountant. And it's not true. It's actually really, really, really simple. Mm -hmm. So um, I like to start with the very first line on your P&L. Whenever I'm doing this presentation with clients or, you know, teaching someone that's that's trying to get more of an understanding on gross profit or net profit, um, I like to start at the very, very top line. If you were to go into your QuickBooks or your Sage and draft your P&L up on the screen and get a report, the first line you're going to see on there is revenue, yeah. right? Income, revenue, sales. Yeah. Income, yeah. revenue, sales. It is sales, right? So it's directly impacted by sales. The only way to grow that number is to either sell more or charge more. There's two options, right? Sell more or charge more. In fact, yeah. I think you call that the two the two finger MBA, right? That's right, the two finger yeah, MBA. Yeah, yeah keep yeah, your yeah. sales so, high and keep your expenses low. Expenses low, right? That's right. So uh, sales is your first cue into managing your GPM because if you're not charging enough mm -hmm. and you're not selling in enough volume, you might not have the chance to sell enough and capture enough gross profit from those sales to actually cover your expenses and end up with net, hmm. right? So what, like, when do we look at sales? When are we tracking our gross income? Well, that's a daily task. It's not like on January 1st, you get to switch the lights on and say, I'm going to make $3 million this year. Yeah, It's something that you need to actively look at and monitor and understand, well, how much income do I need throughout the year on a weekly or a daily or a monthly basis and how to peg that down into gross profit margin uh, and then make net at the end of the year. So you need to be looking at your sales and saying, okay, I need to set a goal for sales by week, by month, by year. Right. And and holding yourself to that goal. Right. That's where that's where you and I introduce the dashboard to people. Yes. It's just absolutely. a simple system to see everything in one easy to look at place. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's income is super straightforward, right? Money in. That's what <laughs> easiest way for me to say it. Money in and it is impacted by sales. Um, now, I will quickly say on the side here, a lot of the contractors in their in, in contracting businesses 
will naturally side with sales, right? As they progress as business owners, they yeah. will become the sales guy and they'll start to hand off production or they'll start to hand off admin and finance. And there's three pillars of business that I, the way that I look at sales mm. and marketing, um, you've got productions and operation, you've got admin and finance. So I call those the three pillars and you can only have one. If you're going to be the owner of the business and then run everything else, you can only have one pillar to own. You can't you own all choose three. it. Yeah. You have to choose. You have to choose or your business will choose you, right? Or your business will choose you for it. So sales impacted by the salespeople and it's a daily task that you need to monitor and set goals for. Next, the topic of this whole discussion, which is gross profit margin, right? So here's yeah. the way that I like to think about GP. Easiest way to understand. Gross profit is all the costs that you wouldn't have to spend if you don't have a job. Like a, a project, I, a job, a project, a, a yeah. gig, a contract, a, a yeah. gig, a contract. You sure? Yeah. yeah. If I don't have, a, if I don't have a project, I don't need to pay for labor. If I don't have a project, I don't have to pay for materials or consumables. Now, again, don't get this confused. If you've got salaried employees, we'll get into that. But if you're, if you have hourly paid employees with billable hours to a customer, this is where that would fall. Yeah. Okay. That's where that would fall. Labor plus burden. If you don't know what burden is, ask your accountant. They'll have a very, very great yeah. conversation with you about how much that costs. But hey, burden is... Sorry, no, on you no, 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 sorry. Go ahead. I'm going to ask you a follow-up question about burden. Sure. I was just going to explain it. Uh, burden is all of your deductions that the government take off you for your employees, your insurance, health benefits, all of that good stuff. It will be different for every company, but essentially burden is all the extras. So yeah. for example, if you're, char if you're, you know, if Paul is making 25 bucks, You've got, you know, roughly around somewhere between, say, two and four percent, depending on where you are, um, is going to be your burden rate. Yeah. So, you know, you're actually paying 30 bucks an hour for Paul to be on your team. It's not 25. Yeah. How And how often this is a little deviation, but it's important when you and I are coaching companies, how often do you see business owners forgetting to calculate the burden, all those soft costs in? Absolutely every time almost. <laughs> yeah. It's the and it's the baseline data. You and I go for that right away, which is interesting because you and I came from different backgrounds, but we're yeah. both turnaround guys. Of course. And we go, and that is always one of the hot spots. Go look for the burden rate. It's just, it seems like it's it there's a, it's a well that never stops giving. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. I'm so glad that's on here and that we had a chance to talk about it because that three to four to five percent is actual money that you should be taking out at the back end. And that's one of the first places that we see it getting lost. Anyways, I'll let 100%. you get back. Yeah. 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 No, major profit leak there. If you don't understand your burden, like, you know, if a guy, even if a guy comes to you and says, I'm going to leave if you don't give me an extra two bucks an hour, you need to understand the true cost of what you're actually paying them after the fact, right? It's not as simple as he asked for two 25, bucks. you're getting 25. Yeah. It costs you $4, right? So you need to be diving into your burden every three to six months and just check it, just shoulder checking that number constantly, yeah. you know, yeah. how, are, how does government uh, state regulations change when it comes to labor, your rate could go up or down. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of variables there. So yeah, um, ask your accountant. Uh, so the second part of gross profit margin is your materials, your materials yeah. being, you know, lumber, paint, chemicals, you know, whatever, whatever you need in your business where it's directly ordered for a job specifically, and it's used on a project, right? Yeah. So, you know, 10 sheets of whatever wood yeah. could you, be acoustic paneling could be plywood could be w whatever it is dimensional lumber but that's Absolutely. material we all understand materials is materials but you can't just say oh we'll just take it out of in inventory and stock it's got to be accounted for we'll get to yeah. that over time perfect absolutely yeah so materials need to be accounted for on a job by job basis yeah and then the last thing is going to be supplies and consumables so supplies and consumables is a bit of a tough one for a lot of people to crack and typically i find out from a lot of clients that they're not charging for supplies and consumables so on yeah. this one uh i would ask the question have you ever had your car in for maintenance i was just and gonna say shop supplies yeah absolutely. you see that they, line there right yeah yeah they hand you they hand you the sheet for so shop supplies and you don't know if they just use one garbage bag or you know they you know replace something that that you needed yeah so charging for consumables is important i've got a really really easy way to break that down in fact i encourage anybody who's listening to the podcast if you want a, a really quick and simple way to figure out what that number is let me know i have a pretty cool calculator that we can use mm -hmm. um but this is where things get important and i want you guys to think of uh the super bowl at half time if you think of what happens at this point is all the players come together 
they go through the playbook, they address, you know, how things are performing on the field, they make a game plan, and then they break and they go off and win. Mm. Nobody does that in the, or very few people do that in the construction industry with gross profit margin, right? If we think of gross profit margin as from start to end, the project success from point mm. A to point Z, we need to shoulder check halfway through. And we do that by one, setting a gross prop, profit margin goal and then forecasting to see where we're at. So for example, uh, in fact, I'm going to show you guys this in a minute, actually. And then I'll come back to the expenses and deductions part. But let's go to the, let's just take a look at a simple cost card or a, oh, end of it. job report. And it's so, the end of job report. This is so famous in our world and on the podcast, the end of job report. So folks, make sure you go to YouTube to check this out if you're listening to this as an audio. Yeah, for sure. Definitely come and check this out. And I, I've taken our, our usual EOJ, which is a bit more, it has a bit more levels of data in it, but I've taken Yeah, this is good for a visual for training. Yeah, I like the way you laid it out. Of course. Yeah. yeah, it's nice and colorful. But even at the, you know, well, let's go super high level and say we have a $30,000 project and we want to achieve a gross profit margin of around 50%, right? Mm -hmm. And again, a reminder of that 50% that's left over, we get to keep 20% if we're really lucky and we yeah. can manage everything Everything after that, if we can manage our expenses. And that's because time. expenses are about 30% if you're running your business right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Industry standard for the cabinet com uh, the cabinet industry is typically around 20%. I've seen guys come in at 16 and get up to that 20% fairly quickly. But then there's also guys in, say, like the closet industry who are doing, you know, 25 to 30% with a smaller average job size. So it really will fluctuate depending on the size of your project. Yeah. But yeah. you need to set a goal. You need to say, I this want to target. set a goal of 20% net, and then we can understand how GP affects that, right? Yeah. Um, so let's just say, for example, we had a $30,000 project, right? You'll see it on my screen for the for the folks that are watching at home. And you can see that, okay, Dominic, right? Absolutely. It's perfect. I Absolutely. love the colors and the layout. Yeah. Awesome. So what we need to do is we actually need to break down the first part of this. Let's split it into the three things that I just talked about. We talked about labor, materials, and then consumables, right? Mm -hmm. So let's start with labor. So we want to understand how we're paying our people on an hourly basis. Even if they're salaried, we need to break it down so that we can apply it to direct billable hours, right? Direct billable hours to a job. You'll hear Dominic and I talk about this a lot in our coaching or on the podcast mm. where we'll say, you need to get time management software or time tracking software implemented tracking. in your business. Oh, such a big change for people. A hundred percent. hundred percent. It's huge. So we want to understand on an hourly basis what the billable hours are to that project and mm. how we're shaping up as we move throughout you know, the start of the project to the end of the project. So there's actually three times that I like to do this document with any project. The first time I like to do it is just after I put my estimate together. Mm. So I put my quote together or my estimate and I'm about to send it to the, to the client. Oh, you I'll do it before you've even sent it to the customer. You go and before. you gut check, you make sure this is right. Absolutely. This is like a quick reference tool that's going to tell me immediately I'm on track and it gives me kind of best case scenario what sure. that looks like. Right. So for the folks that aren't watching uh, on YouTube right now, we're looking at a spreadsheet that's got all of the individual people that work for our business. And this is a an example, but I've got Dave, Andy, Paul, Cindy, Steve, Javier. Um, you know, we have it all listed out with their hourly rates and in our budgeted hours as well. Mm. So this is where we actually get to play the great big video game of project success. And this is to me, and I don't know if I'm just being a bit of a nerd here, but I actually love playing with us to see what that ideal situation is. You're a good like. company with me. A hundred percent. So we've got, we've got, you know, and this is, these are just, don't take these numbers as, as, uh, as fact, because I know that it's going to be different uh, all across your projects and what you, your typical $30,000 project would look like. But I've put in here a budget of 150 hours, right? Sure. That might seem like a lot or it might seem too low. You guys. It's fine. It's a me. model. Yeah. It's a model. It's a model. Work. Yeah. Yeah. It's a model, but we've got, we've got um 150 hours to play with. So what I've actually done is I've come in here and I've mapped out what 150 hours looks like by each member on the team. So if Dave was my project manager mm. and he's going to be on the project the most, right? He's going to be running 40, 40 hours ish. Then Andy's my lead installer. He's going to be doing around 30 hours on this project. Sure. Paul 30, Cindy 15, Steve 20, Javier 15. This is kind of ideal situation at, 100, at 150 hours. So I can do this calculation and figure out that my burden cost or my labor pre-burden is about $4,400. Mm. 
But when I add burden, burden in there, so for this example, I've used 1.36. When I add burden in here, that actually shoots up to $6,022. This is where, and again, just to reiterate, this is where you and I see people losing money. It's one of the profit leaks. When Absolutely. we just calculate straight labor without burden rate, so straight labor, we think it's a $4,400 job in, in labor. But when you add that burden, it's actually six grand. And that it's not magic money. If you don't charge for it, if you don't capture it, if it's not in the estimate, you, the, you know, I'm, I end up paying for it as the business owner. Absolutely. So that's, that's a profit leak right there. It's built into estimating. It's built into sales. It's so easy to fix, but you have to see it to understand it. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, so th like that would be my ideal situation. This is my shoulder check. I'm just checking the hours, right? The next thing I would do is I would come in and I would input my expected material costs. Mm -hmm. So again, for example, I've gotten here that I'm expecting to spend around eight thousand dollars on materials, <laughs> um, which is just over twenty five percent. You know that might be common or not for you, but you know you would just prorate this down for yourself. And then I've got other costs, which is 0.001% of revenue from this project, 25 bucks to give my customer a nice little gift at the end. I like um, I like that. I've always, you know, I've, I've always been a big believer in that. What are you doing to thank the customer, but you actually charge for it in the deal? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's all included. All yeah. included. I'm a big fan of giving bags of local coffee, like roasted coffee to customers with oh, like yeah. a branded mug. That's one of my favorite ones. Um, we, we've trialed a few different things for that. And just let me tell you, Dominic, it's pretty awkward handing a fully grown man, a bunch of flowers. <laughs> that was our gift for a while. And then we also did chocolate, which was all good until the summertime rolled around and you oh, got it gets hot in melting. the car. Yeah. It gets hot in the car. It gets hot in the van. So yeah, coffee's yeah. good. You can keep a stock in the van, but yeah, giving your customer a gift, it's just a little extra piece that they're going to remember. It's just a little extra detail that you can do for your customer, but it's baked in, right? It's baked yeah. into the job uh as a cost so all in all by filling this out before you even send the estimate i can already tell here that i'm looking at about a 53.3 percent gross profit margin that means that i get to keep before expenses which we'll explain after fifteen thousand nine hundred and seventy seven dollars and ninety two cents yeah i actually get to keep that from that original thirty thousand dollars so i'm 53 percent gpm now that's gross. Well, yeah, that's gross profit margin. That's gross. That's gross profit margin, right? Everything else, we need still need to take expenses, deductions, taxes, all of that stuff off of it. But we're just talking about gross profit margin. Mm -hmm. You'll hear me talk about GP way more than that in coaching sessions. And the reason for that is because if I can get you laser focused on making sure that you achieve that 53% every single time consistently. We can control expenses later. We can control expenses later, right? Yeah. Expense is a bit more of a tough nut to crack, but GP is easy. This is where you're going to directly see your systems that you put in your business, your productivity boosters, right? So if you've ever heard Dominic say, you know, get your get your team like an apron with a pencil and a tape measure, right? You'll yeah. see that in the GP. That's where you will actually see that. Yeah. And I'm hey. saying that like literally the next again date. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to ask a question here. Yeah. Um it could be this is the place where once I've done this sheet, and it's just a simple it, I don't want to take away from the sheet. It's simple once you see it and once you understand it. But if the customer comes back to you and says, I need you to sharpen your pencil, do you think you could is there any movement? I could look at this right now and say, I, I don't think there's a lot of movement, but I can now make the decision if I choose as a business owner and I know where the money's gonna come from to make a change in my pricing if I decide to. So Lee and I are never going to tell you not to take a deal. Business case will always prevail, but you have to have the logic behind you to understand where and when that's going to come off. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the most important things that you can do in your business. And I, and I will say this as someone who, you know, came into a business background I was very hesitant to put in numbers and tracking like this in place because I kept telling myself that I was just too busy, right? Like if I was working it's a waste that of time. Hours, yeah, yeah. It's a waste that. of time. I used to and be that guy. Yeah. I would and now I would tell people, like, hey, instead of you saying I'm too busy, I want you to say making money isn't a priority for me. <laughs> how, how stupid do you sound <laughs> when you say that as a business owner, hey, right? Say and, it at the kitchen table with your spouse. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't have time to make money or, you know, that's not a priority for me. I like working too hard. I like, you know, working yeah. 80 hours a week. It it just makes zero sense. So, um, you know, make a time for it. 
make mm-hmm. time for it like figure out these numbers to put in yourself and just make time for it and it, when you know about it and you focus on it it will happen the gpm will happen which means that expenses can be managed later on so uh so yeah this is like the first time i'm checking this is before i send the estimate i would mm-hmm. then send the estimate the customer would sign off the second point that i would do this is actually midway through the job so I'd come midway through the job and I'd just shoulder check myself and I'd be like, right, what mm-hmm. are the hours that I've spent using my time tracking software that we talked about earlier? Yeah, yeah. What are my materials looking like so far? Have I placed all my orders? Do I have all my invoice numbers? Yeah. Have my total amount? Um, and then what that's going to do for me is the same thing as the halftime huddle at the football game. We can regroup. We can have a discussion. We can make a game plan to win pull things back on track if we're off yeah and we've got a much higher chance of making more money per project from a gpm site even if it was less than your original projection you have the opportunity to make the most of it it gives yeah. you real time it gives you real time data gives you real time opportunity to actually make a change and make that GPM. And this is, I, don't, I, I get super excited when I talk about this because honestly, when you can see a project forecasting to, you know, you know, negative profit and you can squeeze the 10% out instead and make the best of a bad situation. Yeah. yeah. It's huge. It's huge. You know, I, I can hear if there's somebody out there right now, my nose is itching. So I know that somebody's saying something and they're saying, you know, guys, Lee and Dom, this all sounds great, but you don't understand my business. I do it by the linear foot. Of course. Right? Yeah. Or uh, I charge for uppers and lowers and I kind of got it figured out. It'd be impossible. Impossible. Could it be done for me to break out how much flat stock we're going to use on a job? 100%. Yeah. And, and, that's, and Lee, that's... you and I run across that all the time. What you just We don't have to go down that path. That's another episode altogether. But what would you say to somebody in that case? I would say, well, you just need to figure it out. Yeah. It's nothing more complicated than that. Let's just go figure it out. It's figure outable. It's figure outable. But you know what? Everybody starts off that way as well. This is too much data. This is too much data entry. This is too much this. This is too much that. And you're right. Yeah. Like it is a law. It's not designed for you to do it as the business owner. (laughs) It's not. It's designed for your admin or your team or your office person to actually do this for you. I just want to remind everybody that as you grow, your systems will change. So yes, charging for uppers and lowers or charging by the linear foot worked to get you to X. Just I'll just say X is 500 grand. It doesn't matter what the number is. But if you want to get to 600, 700, 800, linear foot may not, might not work for you anymore. You might have to change your system. So be open to changing your systems. And what Lee and I are showing you here, and this is a beautiful visual, by the way, really impactful, is a way to change the system. That's it. Absolutely. It's just a path. Yeah, it's it's it, that's exactly what it is, right? Like it's a map. That's what it is. It's a yeah. map to success. Yeah, a map to success. So, uh, so yeah. So like, if I'm shoulder checking this halfway through, I'm giving myself the best chance of success to actually achieve that GPM goal that I was trying to set out. Even yeah. if I come, even if I come in under, if something went totally sideways on the project, at least I had the chance to do something about it. You know. Yep. Yeah. So. Then after uh, the, we, we and you can do this every single day throughout the project if you wanted this so that you've got real time data happening every single day to see where you're at. If you wanted yeah. to, you totally can. You have that option. Um, but for most people, you know, they'll come to the end of the job. They'll, you know, run like an EOJ. And this happens a lot with our clients when they, they start with us. Right. Is we'll give them an EOJ and we'll say, hey, go back to a few of your jobs and look at the EOJ. Yeah. Fill out the details and they go, oh, Oh, I didn't, I didn't make as much money as I thought I was. Yeah. Making on it that, starts with, you know? Oh, and then they do the face palm. Yeah. yeah, uh, Because you think you're making a lot and you're not right. Until yeah. you're actually tracking the data and seeing how that happens. So, yeah. Um, well, you've got the go back section in this report. I do. Which I do, is, so I, which is interesting because that's one of the places that we get caught. Yeah. As business owners, the go backs. Absolutely. And this is, orders. that's ex- exactly the point that will derail your business. Yeah. I've always said this about uh, construction businesses is any kind of go back will will kill your business. It will be the leading cause of the death of your business. If you're continually having to go back and fix projects and you've got customers who are holding, say, an invoice over your head and saying, I'm not paying until this is resolved. 
those things, too many projects like that, and you will kill your business. So this is yeah. why it is important to implement systems. You know, in fact, even coming to us and asking for some of the systems that we use to keep projects on track, to keep them moving smoothly, to keep them profitable. Yeah. You know, it's just going to help you avoid the go back section altogether. And that's why it's hidden on the sheet and you have to actually drop it down is because we don't want to talk about go backs. It's there because if I was to go into this go back and say, well, actually, it took another six hours for each employee, it's going to derail my GPM. And yeah, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, though, even though that might be the case, let's say it did take an extra six hours per employee. I would rather learn that on this job than relearn that same lesson every job all year long for the next 10 years. Because unfortunately, you and I know that there are people out there who do that. They just ignore the problem, hoping it's going to go away. And it's not. It's yeah. not going to go away. So you I'll might do as well you one face better. it head on. Yeah. I'll do you one better and say, I'd rather find out on the sheet before I even send the estimate. Yeah, true. Nicely right? done. Yeah. 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 And so don't send the estimate. Don't send the estimate. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> or, or just charge way more. Right. Yeah. Like this thing yeah. is essentially a crystal ball where you can, you know, look yeah. into it and say, okay, you know, how much am I going to be tearing my hair out? You know, and how angry is the bank manager going to uh-huh. be at me when I'm, when I'm over. Right. So, yeah. So, anyway. The, I, I can't even stress how much it's important for you to look at your GPM daily. Setting daily goals, setting annual goals, setting monthly goals, and just holding yourself to that. If you can set your, even just start with setting a simple GP goal. Every project that I do, I need to make 50%. Every project that I, do, I need to make 60%. You choose what it is. Yeah. Right? You choose what those what that GP is. Then 30% for expenses, then 20% net or 25% net. It's up to you how well you can control that. And I'm going to talk about expenses in a second here. Um, but GP is your key to net, not the other way around, right? A lot, of, a lot of business owners have been brainwashed into thinking that net is just a byproduct, that they get to tense themselves up and open that email from their accountant you know, the following year. 18 months. So the year plus the time it takes the accountant to get them the report. Exactly. So they just don't have time to go back and make the changes. They've already been running for another 18 months, making the same mistakes as they did. Yeah. In the, yeah it's, yeah. It, it can lead and to some tough situations. Here's the thing too, right? Like if you're on top of this, if you're on top of gross profit and you're on top of your net and you're proactively managing it, you can spend money throughout the year that you're making from that profit. If you want to expand and grow, right? Like if you all of a sudden wanted to buy a new van and add two members to the team. Well, it's funny you say that. If you're profitable job by job, you'll be profitable at the end of the year. As long as you're not buying pizza and sushi every night out of out of cash flow and, and, and funneling it out of there. But if you're profitable job by job, you'll be profitable at the end of the year. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's actually talk about that for a minute. If, uh, if we can go into like, just go back into the PL and just talk about the, that's what I was going to say. This is great. You call it the cost card. I call it the end of job report. That's what people on the show recognize it as. Thank you. So yeah, so we're back at the PL now. And again, a reminder, folks, you might be walking through the shop or walking your dog, listening to this as a podcast. This is definitely one of those times you have to go back to the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel has the same name, Cabinet Maker Profit System. It can't be any longer. That's the maximum number of characters. But you'll see Lee walking us through this. Thanks, Lee. Back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about, we've. let's just say we've done mm-hmm. a great job at bringing revenue in. Mm-hmm. We've done a really good job of managing our gross profit margin. So managing our labor, managing our materials, and managing our consumables, right? Now, there's a couple of things we need to take off, right? So... Let me, if I, let me go back here, variable costs or your gross profit is managed by your production manager. Mm -hmm. That's who runs it, right? If you've got an operations manager or a production manager in your business, and it's his or foreman, and it's their job to lead the team to complete a project, that is the person who is directly influencing your variable costs. It's interesting you say that. I just had this conversation today with a coaching client. And he's like, I don't know if we're ready for a foreman yet. He's one and a half million in revenue. Mm. Like the the opportunity cost that's being lost by not having one person responsible for shop operations is incredible. It's just for incredible. Sure. And you you can't go find that unless somebody's full-time job is finding those opportunities. Yeah, I'm glad you yeah. brought that up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And just one more thing on that as well. Like if you've got a production manager, but they don't know what their KPIs are, they don't know what their goals are from a GPM standpoint, and they're not in the loop on that gross profit conversation you'd be as well, you know, they just wandering out there doing their thing, you know, like I just, chicken with their head cut off. 
I just had an outer body moment. That sentence you just said, most cabinet makers couldn't, don't talk about. No. KPIs no. for your GPM, but I bet you almost everybody listening here understands KPIs are your key performance indicators for your gross profit margin. This is the CEO level conversations that you and I have all day with people. But most, if, if you're not in this environment, if you're not in the cabinet maker profit system community, you're just never going to talk like this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah ab- so absolutely. Cool. I apologize yeah. to everyone. I'll try and. No, no, no. <laughs> I said it. I said it as a compliment to everybody listening. Oh, okay. To gotcha. us on this show, that's how we talk. That's what we're, we're here to educate people on how to run a solid contracting business that happens to be a cabinet maker. You just, you're a business person that happens to run a cabinet shop. Fantastic. But this is how we talk. Yeah, absolutely. And just for anybody that is listening, that doesn't know what KPI is, it's key performance indicator. It's basically a metric that you would look at to snapshot and take a quick look and see how successful your business is or isn't at that time. So yeah, you and I show people KPIs all the time, but that's, that's the cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So your production manager, if he doesn't have a goal or she doesn't have a goal of what they should be looking at and how their 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 actual performance impacts GPM, mm-hmm. you need to sit down and have an alignment conversation and say, this is what success looks like. This is the number. This is how we're going to measure it. And you're going to have a key, uh, a key responsibility in helping us manage this number. We talk, if you guys have ever read Scaling Up, for example, or like the Rockefeller Habits, they talk about one number that everybody's responsible for in your business. Yeah. Make the GPM your production manager's key number one performance indicator. Yeah. I'll that tell you, the other one. the other thing that, that's probably going to hit home with a lot of people listening is I want you to think about go backs. Or let me get even more specific. How many times has a job left your shop without kicks? And now somebody's got to go back with the kicks. Now you've got a customer that's potentially upset. You've got a crew you got to send back. You got to do more machining. Maybe you've got to get the paint booth set up again just for the kicks. If your production manager, which is foreman, is responsible for making sure that complete projects leave the shop, that's a KPI. That's something we can count. It's one or it's two. It's yes or it's no. But imagine the impact on your business if you had 100% complete projects leaving and there were no go backs. The heavens would open, angels would sing, and they would dab your tongue with a golden napkin. It would be the best thing ever. That's a KPI. Absolutely. I love how you just said that there. That's great. But let's let's move on, right? Let's get past gross profit margin because I think I've stressed it enough how important and how excited I get about it personally. I love Apparently it. I do too. <laughs> and I know, I know. But let's talk about let's talk about expenses. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, expenses are different, right? They're a little bit different than than some of your variable costs. It's stuff that you can forecast way easier, Mm. which is a good thing. But on the flip side, it's also way harder to reduce those costs if you had to, right? So if we think about 30% expenses, I mean, there's, you know, anywhere between say 20 and 100 things that you could possibly be spending to keep your lights on in your business, Mm -hmm. right? Vehicles, salaries, uh, you know, toilet paper, light bulbs, like all of that stuff counts. And you're like, wait, I'm not putting light bulbs or toilet paper in the PL. It should go in there because that's <laughs> it where it belongs. That's right? the cost for running the business. Yeah. The cost of running the business. Um, but this part is a bit more difficult, right? It's not like you can just call up the bank and say, hey, can I ne- negotiate down the loan that you gave me on this, right? On the on on say the shop or you know, my mortgage. It's not like you're going to spend three hours calling all the cell phone suppliers and trying to negotiate down a better deal. You could, and I would highly encourage you to do so because you should be minimizing your expenses, but it's way harder and it takes way longer to do, which is where a bookkeeper comes in super handy because a bookkeeper can make recommendations for you throughout the course of a month and say, okay, Dominic, if you were my client and I'm your bookkeeper, I'd be handing you the P&L and saying, hey, we only forecasted two hundred dollars for the cell phone this month. How come it's three hundred and eighty? Yeah. Wait, hold on a minute. That's a really good thought. Why is it three hundred and eighty? Right. Mm. And if if you're not in a habit of looking at your P and L and addressing your expenses every single month, there could be profit leaks that are slipping out the door that you're not aware of. Right. Subscriptions yeah. that you signed up for this year. Subscriptions. Who has yeah. a gym membership in their wallet? that they still haven't used this week or this month, or maybe even this year. I just actually did that exercise, Lee, with a, a client, you know this, one. but uh, yeah. we found a cell phone that hadn't been used in years that he was still paying for and a software program that he had subscribed to that he hadn't even used. And it was about to auto renew for another year. 
So stuff just over the course of time, things just add up and they get into your expenses. Um, yeah. Ex now expenses are manageable, but there comes a point when you drop it so far that you, you sacrifice quality or safety uh, or service. And you have to be really careful there. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's why I say like having a percentage goal for your expenses will tell you. And then the, the good thing about that is if you need to do a calculation to see what your forecast looks like in say three years or four years or five years, yeah. you can just prorate your current expenses up to that number and you can kind of have a, like almost a an budget. idea of what, what it's going to cost you yeah. to do business. Yeah. If, if for every million dollars of production, you know that you used, let's say a thousand dollars in sandpaper, well, that's our budget for next year. A thousand dollars in sandpaper. If we do another million, if we do two million, we're going to spend two thousand on sandpaper, approximately. And you now have a budget. It's not, it's not complicated. You just have to know where to look to get that information and how to put it together. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. Yeah, and then we, I actually had this conversation earlier with one of my clients, and I'm going to give him a shout out because I told him to keep an eye out, an ear out for uh, for this podcast today is we had that same conversation is we actually worked out every van in his business of installers and he's a closet company. Yeah. Um, he can produce a million dollars worth of revenue per vehicle. Per vehicle. Yeah. yeah. Right. So when number. we can, when we can do that fast math, we know what the next steps are. Right. And then if we know how much it's going to cost us to scale a business to that size, we know what the team size and infrastructure looks like. The only thing we need to worry about is where do we get the leads? How do we increase leads to actually capture that and support a business of that size? How fast can I get more vans on the road? Absolutely. Yeah. And this is, that's my favorite point for a lot of people because I'd rather have the people and I'd rather have the infrastructure in place and then worry about the leads. That's the best case scenario. Yeah. Because we can get the leads. We can get the leads. Finding yeah. good people, you know, managing the expenses, like that's harder. It's way better. It's way easier to get the leads. Way easier to get the leads. So in saying that, um, with your expenses, we're talking about vehicles and rent and salaries. And again, if you're watching this on YouTube, this is just an example. You would have way more uh, expenses oh, than right. what I've got listed here in, in column C. Um, but your expenses, your the person who directly influences that is your bookkeeper. You need to have an alignment meeting with your bookkeeper and your accountant present. And everybody that I've done this with, with my coaching clients has mm. said, I just walked away feeling more informed about the financial health of my business, way more in tune with it. And I feel like I have a better relationship with the people who are in control of my finances. Right? Yeah. It's <laughs> it's a game changer. It's a simple alignment meeting. You're saying, this is the this is the information I need. This is when I need it. And this is this is how I'm going to use that information. And when everybody understands that and you're aligned, you'll you'll feel way more confident in your health of your business, and you'll also know where you're going to land for net profit. So you're you're running the business on purpose. You are, you yeah. are, and you're utilizing people around you to do so. You're not just you know being fed information and being like, oh, okay, I guess that is what it is. You're in real time. You can make a game plan. You can make changes, and you've got people there to support you to do that too from your bookkeeper and your accountant. Mm. So highly encourage you to do that on the 15th of the following month. If you're getting monthly P&L sent to you on the 15th, a lot of the contractors that I talk to say, I only look at my P&L at the end of the year, or I only look at it once every six months. And I'm like, you're crazy. That's the number one thing that you should be looking at to gauge success in your business yep. to say, all right, shoulder check, 15th of the next game month, I'm $20,000 off my goal for revenue. And I'm ten, you know, ten thousand dollars off my goal for profit. I can make that back up next month or the month after. I just went through the playbook, did the team huddle, halftime show, and I can make a game plan and move on. Perfect. Right? Yeah. And I mean, there's going to be guys sitting here listening to this who are like kicking themselves, and they're like, "That makes so much sense." And you're right; it does make so much sense now that you're hearing it for the stage that you're at right now. But you're going to get to a point in your business where mm. you can't progress as a business owner or an entrepreneur without knowing and understanding these, like these kinds of information yeah. and data sets, right? Well, these are the conversations so, that you and I have with people. And just yeah. by virtue of the fact that we're showing up Tuesday at two to have that conversation, suddenly people get very interested in making sure that information is delivered, right? Of course, hundred yeah. percent, hundred percent. And, and, you know, even for me, like I feel bad because this is second nature to me now. It took a long time to get there, but you need to, you know, I needed to put myself in a position where I was open to giving it a try to yeah. really see the, the rewards and it totally came back. So invest in yourself as, as a leader, uh, invest in yourself as an entrepreneur, 
you know, business books, things like, you know, scaling up, mm -hmm. you've got, uh, there's hundreds of books out there, you know, I'm looking at a shelf up above me right now, um, of books that will, you know, give you all some of all this information. I will add here that you can fast track that and just come straight to us at 10 XBL team. Yeah, we we've read all the books. That. Yeah. We've read them all. Um, but yeah, like that's expenses are important. GPM is more important. Uh, manage your expense as well. Double down laser focus on variable costs or various good, uh, variable goods, and you will make your gross profit margin. And if you do those two things, what comes next? Net profit. Or sorry, deductions, then net profit. Dedu the government, yeah. <laughs> sorry, the deductions. The government has to take what they need to take, um, yeah. which is something that only your accountant can do because you need to have a, a CPA to do that. Um, but they'll do your taxes and depreciation and all of that good stuff. Everything past that point is then net profit. So in this, profit. the, yeah, all of this, and that's how you actually get there, right? It's not just something that you wait until the end of the year to get. You have to go through column A, column B, column C, column D. It's like a big filter. It's like a big, uh, where you lose money all the way, along, all the way down that filter, Yeah, you know, and you're standing with your cup at the bottom going, shaking it, saying, Can I have is, some? There, well, is there any left? When yeah. you know the numbers though, it, and it falls within expectations, it's the same as anything. You start with a big sheet of wood. And you cut some, we don't worry about the waste. That's just going to happen. It's already built into the price. And it's the same thing with our business. We've got this big, big playing sheet in front of us. We know it's going to get cut. It's going to get cut. It's going to get cut. And then the final piece is the net profit. We're left with that highly valuable, highly machined piece of, of work. In our case, as business coaches and as owners, that's net profit. We don't worry about all that other waste. And we have to manage it effectively, but that's what's good. That's what we're going to get at the end. Yeah. Absolutely. So in this in, in this example, right, we've we've went in to get a million dollars is what we've went for. You know, as we've progressed, we walked out with a GP of five hundred and ninety two thousand dollars. And if you know, I'm, I'm just explaining this if you're not watching on the YouTube show, mm. but we've walked out with a fifty nine percent GPM. Right. We walked out with a gross margin of fifty nine percent, almost sixty yep. percent. At the end of the day, we only walked away with twenty four percent, which was two hundred and forty thousand dollars that I get to theoretically stuff in my jeans and you know buy that boat that i always wanted or that cabin on the lake so yeah and just can i just add one more thing absolutely this is this is all with the business owner you guys <clears throat> taking a salary oh that's right well. we forgot to say that they're still getting paid in here because you normalized uh, i'm not going to get into the, that accounting terminology but that's right we calculate that the owner's getting paid that they're actually taking a salary and then dividends come out of net profit absolutely yeah. yeah. So that two that two hundred and forty thousand is a, is a big fat check at the end of the year that you can use to either upgrade your infrastructure, get new machinery, you know, debt servicing, for, anything else like yeah, that. Your account is actually going to help you make the most of that too. Yeah, I like to call that the growth fund. I'm like that's that's the money that I get to actually use to grow this business, mm. and I can invest say a hundred thousand dollars of that next year to turn this business from a one million to a two point two million. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, that's, I that, you know what, I, I'm uh, I'm glad you brought that up, though. It's important that people understand that while we're doing this math, the owner's getting paid the whole time and getting paid market rates. So now you've got a million dollar business where you as the owner are taking home a consistent paycheck to your kitchen table. And uh, the net profit is two hundred and forty thousand eight hundred dollars based on this model. But this is actually a it's a it's a model that actually works because we see it all the time. 100%. Yeah, very, very simple. Revenue minus variable costs or, G, you know, your G, where your GP comes from, minus expenses, minus deductions equals net. It's very, very simple calculation. It's all stuff that you can easily put in place in your business, set goals for and achieve. And again, if you can't just set the goal, you need to set milestones. You need to know month by month how much GP, how much net you need to make on a month by month mm -hmm. and control it at all times it's super honestly if it comes to net profit you want to make money guys this is the way to do it that's you'll have an immediate i can guarantee you that if you implement this in your business tomorrow you'll see thousands of dollars with the even the last you know 40 days that we have of the year yeah. if you were implement this tomorrow you will see well on the next job the next you would see it in on the, the next, next job, job in the very next yeah. job right yeah so if you're doing a ten thousand dollar job it's going to impact you if you're doing a million dollar millwork job it's going to impact you yeah 100 percent Lee, this is fantastic. So, and you know, clearly you've had a, a background in education. And I should say a background in adult education, which is different, like teaching um, adults, which came from your hospitality background. Um, 
And then business coaching and turnarounds, which both you and I have had experience in and laying something out like this in such an easy to understand format. It might not be easy the first time somebody sees it, but when no. you and I are walking them through it and we can bring it to life and like, well, look at this and then add that in and you know, here's how you change it. And here's a couple of tips. That's how you really, that's how you get ahead because experience is an expensive teacher. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no need to, there's no need to go and reinvent the wheel. Just talk to us. And we'll, we'll show you the, the, the inside track, the shortcuts, if you will. Uh, That's and, right. and where some of the pitfalls are too, because not every shortcut's a good one to take. Yeah. 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 You're totally right. Wow. That was a heck of an interview. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big talk. I get, I get so jazzed about this topic because I'm like, it's just so impactful to people who have never heard this concept or have never had it explained this kind of simply right um yeah i would i would challenge anybody who's listening to the podcast like get in touch with us we'd love to chat with you and even you know give you some stuff to take away where you could implement a few different tools like this in your own business it's not difficult we want to see everybody succeed whether you're a coaching client or not everybody who is in our network we want to make sure that you guys are succeeding you can fast track your learning i like to cut your learning curve off by like four or five years of pure misery and lost money by coming out to us, let us work with you for a little bit. Let us give you the tools that you that you need. Mm. Even if it was for six months, let us work with you for six months. The first half of 2024, you will be a different business owner running a different business that is just completely leveled up and is ready and has the springboard to go to multiple seven figures. Yeah. That's that's what me that's what it means to get to the next level. You've got to yeah. do you've got to make some changes to get there. And and these are part of those simple systems to do it. For sure. Well, Lee, let's um let's wrap up and tell people how to reach us, how to reach you if they have questions. For sure. Yeah. If you want to get in contact with me, and again, if you you know you want to go over this stuff or you want to have a friendly chat, you can just shoot me an email to Lee at 10xblt.com. Very simple. Very, Very much simple. like what we've got on our, on our what show. If, yeah, our logo. And 10 is spelled one zero. So it's not yes. T-E-N. It's 10xblt. Lee, do you remember what you said to me the first time I introduced you to the company? I said, oh, we're called 10xblt. And do you remember? And I, I asked you if that was the lunch order. <laughs> it's an order for sandwiches, 10 bacon, lettuce, tomatoes. No, it's dead. Yeah. You know, it's, it's for guy. And again, this goes back to the conversations that we have about profit. Most people leave profit out of, out of their conversation, but what they want is they want to, they want to have a, a newer boat, drive it to a nicer lake, towing it with a newer truck, boat, lake, truck, BLT. It's just, it's pretty basic. But at the end of the day, I think most of the people here want to be a good dad, good husband, good grandfather, good, you know, maybe mom, aunt, uh, whatever it is. And, you know, money's the, the outcome. Money's the outcome. And uh, uh, but the, the life they get to lead along the way. That's what we're all here for. Lee, thank you. I have to say you're having an impact. I got a testimonial, by the way, about you today. I'll have to share it with you afterwards. Oh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing you're doing fantastic work with all the, the, the clients you're working with. And folks, thank you very much for checking in. I'm glad you got a chance to meet Lee. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Lee's going to also be on the Profit Tool Belt podcast. So if you want to double down, you can hear his episode there very shortly as well. And it is a different one. Yeah, it's a different topic. Yeah, it's not the different same topic. One. Yeah. Although you and I could do this topic again and probably be just as excited. For sure. For yeah. Sure. yeah th thanks so much to everyone who's listening today. It was great to finally jump on the podcast. And uh, yeah, hopefully I can come back and do a few more. with Donald. Oh, you will. You will. Yeah. Rate, right. rate the show for me if you if, if you oh, enjoyed nice. this one rate the show and then i'll know if it was because i was on then i can chirp dom about it so, <laughs> it's we're I based on chirping chirping is what we do yeah absolutely uh, all right lee thanks a lot well 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 what did you learn from coach lee miller can you see why lee is on the team <laughs> why why he is one of the business coaches on our team uh, can you see why I invest so much in coaching and training and supporting him so that he's supporting the clients that we bring on? I, I really do have a, a pretty unique team here, and I'm very proud of them. Thank you, Lee, for joining us today. Uh, based on what you learned here today, folks, what can you put in place? It doesn't have to be a lot of things. Lee covered a lot of ground. But what are the simple things you can put in place? What's just one thing? You just have to put one thing in place. That's all. You know, think about the baseball analogy. You don't have to... You don't have to hit a home run every time you get up to the plate to win the game. You just have to hit a single. And if from what you learned from Lee here today, you're able to hit a single this week, that's fantastic. 
but you can hit a single every week of this year. Where would you be if you hit a single every week this year? Assuming you started in January, that'd be 52 singles, right? How many times would you run around? How many home runs would you score? How different would your business be if you started to put little changes in place like this? Remember earlier, I made the promise. I want you to be a business person who just happens to be a contractor. Think about somebody else in your city or your town, your state, your province. Who's that same thing? They're a captain of industry, a leader in the community. They're giving back to the community. What business are they running? They're running some sort of company, but you recognize them as a business person. I'll bet you anything they're a contractor or contracting or real estate or real estate development or land development is somewhere in their background. I guarantee that. And yet we see them as a business person who just happens to be a contractor. That could be you as well. Hey, listen, let me read a testimonial here before we get to the next part. I'm going to solve a business solution in a second, but we got a really nice testimonial the other day. Um, Look no further for the best business coach. Dom has been my business coach for a little over a year. The insight he provided helped me see things from another angle. His coaching has tremendously helped improve my business and make it more successful and efficient. I would highly recommend anyone seeking business coaching to give Dom a shot. It's been well worth the investment for me. I would also recommend listening to Dom's podcast, The Profit Tool Belt. So that's the other show. This is Cabinet Maker Profit System we're listening to here, but there is another podcast. It's called Profit Tool Belt. This is where I was introduced to Dom and was truly able to understand what makes him a great coach. Uh, the reason I read that is because I want you to know that there's other people out there who've decided to take a step in their lives and start working with a coach like myself or Lee or any of the other coaches on our team. A little at a time, we get you ahead. I don't, it's not overnight results. It's just not. What it is though, is wise moves planned in advance that give you the quiet confidence to build your business. The gentleman that wrote that testimonial, the reason he stopped coaching is he got married and he needed to focus on, on that. And what we did with coaching is we got him the profitability such that he could buy a ring for his new bride. He actually made the ring. I mean, talk about putting taking it to another level. But one of the things we did with him is we put a dashboard in place and that dashboard allowed him to understand the profitability job by job that profitability allowed him the confidence to be able to propose to his girlfriend. The other thing the dashboard did, and he added this himself, that dashboard allowed him to understand how much profit he made on the job versus how much profit he expected to make on a job. And clever he was, he used any overage on the anticipated profit to put towards a fund to buy a ring. And I, I think Calling it a ring is an understatement. You should see this thing. It is an architectural gem. The, this is a ring. Uh, anyways, that's the story behind the story. If you want to be like that, you know, keep listening to the show. If you want to reach out to us and talk about yourself and, and get feedback on your company, happy to do that. Anyways, uh, let's simplify and solve a common problem. Here's a common problem. The common problem we have in contracting is, Dom, I've been running this business for a while. I got it to where it is today. And I know there's a lot of changes. I don't know what to do first. There's a lot to choose from. And so what happens, and I've, I've had this myself, is I get stuck in something called analysis paralysis. There's so much to do. I don't know where to start. There's so many things clawing at me, pulling at me, that I have no idea where to begin. And that's hard. I found that to be some of the most stressful times in my life, like gut-wrenching, burning in my stomach, pain in my neck like just if i sometimes i would uh, i've been in the situation where i finished the day and realized i've been clenching my teeth all day because i was so focused on the business and what i had to do next and so stuck at the same time just doing busy work you know one of those days where you come home and uh, i would come home and my wife would say hey what'd you do today i have no idea i've been flying all day i've been busy Every single second of this entire day, I have no idea what I accomplished. None. If you've ever been in a situation like that, because I have, I had to go out and look for certain tools to get me through it. I always, I always want to be proactive in my business, right? And so the tool that I came upon is this workbook. The workbook is called Where Are My Blind Spots? It's a construction business 
reality check. I mean, that's really what it is. Construction business reality check. It's 20 questions. That's all it is. It's 20 questions. Those 20 questions, though, you answer on your own. So this is an opportunity, by the way, for you to go for coffee. If you've listened to my show ever, you'll know that one day I want to have a coffee with you, just like normal humans, two guys getting together and having a coffee or maybe a glass of wine, depending on the time of day. Let's focus on coffee right now. Keep it business conversation. But I just want you to go have a coffee on your own. Get out of the office. I don't need you in the office. I don't even want you in your truck. I want you to treat yourself to a nice coffee somewhere. Get out, turn off your phone, put your headphones in so nobody's going to bug you. Have this printout in front of this, this document. So it's a workbook. It's called Where Are My Blind Spots? A Construction Business Reality Check. This solves the problem of analysis paralysis. This solves the problem of where do I start? This solves the problem of I understand I need to change something. I just can't put my finger on what needs to change. But I know that if I change something, the upside is there. If you're in that boat, then this is this is how you you pull it apart so you can put it back together, right? This is a, a tool that I would use as a business coach. I have used as a business coach. Coach Lee and I use this with clients. We use this with people to help us prioritize what has to come first, what has to come last, what we can ignore. Wouldn't it be nice to know you can ignore things? You can ignore stuff. Anyways, I want you to go to a coffee shop. Have this thing printed out. Put your headphones in. Grab a nice cup of coffee. I will buy you your coffee. I'll buy you your coffee. All you have to do is take a selfie of yourself with the printout and a coffee at a coffee shop. It's pretty simple. Um, And by the way, other people have done this already. So what I do is I send an Amazon gift card for five bucks. So I'm going to buy your coffee. Even if we don't have a chance to have a coffee together. Uh, Who have I gotten uh, 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 pictures from? Uh, Jonathan in Vancouver. Uh, Brian in Australia sent me a picture of a very small coffee. He must've been having an espresso. Uh, Nick in Edmonton sent me a coffee, uh, of himself. Uh, James down in South America. Hey, James, James might be one of the longest listeners to our podcast. Hello, James, uh, Corey in Oregon, uh, David in Jamaica. Lots of people have sent, and this is just off the top of my head. I'm sorry if I've forgotten anybody. Lots of people have taken selfies and sent them and I get to, I get to send you a coffee money back. That's all I want to do. Anyways, if you want this document, there's 20 questions. It's laid out. How many pages? is it? Three pages. At the very bottom, uh, and, and the first page is a cover page, so it's two pages. At the, uh, the very bottom of that last page, there is a tiny little formula. You can do this with your hand. You know, you count on your hands. But it says, add all five numbers to get your percentage score. And then it's a simple statement. This is the current state of your company. Don't you want to know if your company comes out at 30% or maybe it comes out at 87%? I don't know, but you'll know. Based on that, each of the 20 questions, and each of them is laid out in a grid, right? So question 15, it just happens to be in the middle of my page here. Question 15 is laid out. It's a very simple question. And then you have, you can score yourself either one, two, three, four, or five on that, right? Now, one is weak and five is strong. If you Let's keep using question 15 as an example. Here's the question. Answer this for yourself. Would you be weak or strong in this? All of our teams clearly identify, discuss, and solve key issues for the greater good and long term. So think about that. What about your field crew? What about you and your bookkeeper? That's a team, right? Your field crew is a team. What about you and your spouse? What about you and your business partner? What about whoever you have as a team, right? What are you, whatever you've got, that's just one of the questions. Here's uh, question 18. I'll just keep going for a second. A simple scorecard for weekly metrics and measurables is in place. It covers marketing, sales, drafting, production, project management, quality control, and finances. Would you be weak or strong in that? A bunch of you right now are scratching your head, rubbing your nose. I got gotcha. you, right? If that's not in place, that's okay. But now you have a score. Based on that score, you can get focused. When you get focused, you can take action. You know what to ignore and you know what to focus on. That's all I want for you. Anyways, if you want this thing, it's called Blind Spots. We just send it by email. It's pretty low tech. (laughs) I love low tech. Just text me. Send me a text message and just say that word blind spots. My cell phone is 315-903-7853. That's it. And just say blind spots. 
then we'll we'll shoot this back to you. You can print it off, go to a coffee shop, and then again, I'll buy your coffee, man. Until we get a chance to sit with each other, let me buy you the coffee this way. The old Amazon gift card. Uh, so yeah, uh, let me wrap up here. Send a text message. Just say blind spots. Uh, one more time, 315-903-7853. Thanks for checking in, folks. I really do mean it. I look forward to the day when you and I can have a coffee, uh, maybe a glass of wine, like I said, and just talk like normal humans across the table. Uh, until then, this podcast is going to have to do. Maybe we'll get on a Zoom call one day. That's That's a nice middle spot. But listen, either way, I really look forward to the day when we can actually meet. I prefer that over this. Um, but until then, we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for checking in.